with our speaker, um, Irina Conboy, who I've learned a great deal about these last couple of days. She's a very interesting person to talk to. Um, her pedigree is very good. Um, she went and did, she, I guess, probably grew up around Moscow, and then uh, went to do her graduate work in um, Stanford with Irv Weissman and Patricia Jones, where she was working on immune diseases, um, signaling in T cells and B cells. And she then went to do a postdoc uh, with Tom uh, Rando's group, and this is really where I became, became familiar with her work because she was doing these amazing parabiosis experiments that were you know, showing the molecular mechanisms of how you can rejuvenate muscle stem cells. Um, now, she, she, she moved to Berkeley, where she's an, she was an assistant professor until 2010, um, and then now she's an associate professor. She has an, uh, many different awards, including a Keck Award, a Glenn Award, a CERM New Faculty Award, Stem Cell Research Foundation Award, and she also had an Ellison Medical Foundation Award. Um, she's also now a member of the advisory board for Faculty of a Thousand. And of course, um, she's very well funded and um, her publications are amazing. And so I'm sure we'll all um, enjoy her talk today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some these guys go like this. So thanks so much for this uh, introduction, which is almost all accurate, except that I'm very well funded. <laughs> Everything else is absolutely correct. I don't think there is such thing as being very well funded. <laughs> it always kind of goes and strides and you always want more, right? So um, also thank you so much for coming. And what I want to tell you before my seminar starts, since we have plenty of time, please feel free to interrupt me during my presentation. Do not wait with your questions until the very end. In fact, I would enjoy it much more and so probably the rest of the audience. So my first slide is kind of philosophical slide on understanding of the relation between aging and disease. So as you all know, the incidence of very bad diseases dramatically increase with age, exponentially, in fact, increase with age after a certain period of time. And those bad diseases are represented by sarcopenia, for example, which is muscle wasting, osteoporosis, incidence of cardiovascular diseases, Metabolic disorders such as type 2 diabetes, strokes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, many of the really horrible diseases, including flare of cancer. And they rarely happen in the young people or young animals, and then they just flare with advancing age. So the question is, why does it happen? Why we know that invariably we will succumb at least to one of these bad disorders as we grow old? On the surface, it's easy to understand. You could just say, well, we are born with this new set of organs, and then we use them, and they were out. But that is not really the correct answer, because if you compare a squirrel, and squirrels actually live 30 years, and a rat, rats only live three years. So a three-year-old squirrel will be very, very young and very healthy. And three-year-old rat will be very old and very unhealthy. And what is the difference, right? So squirrel and rat are approximately the same size. They both have very high metabolism. And in my picture, they even look into the same direction, right? They're kind of positioned like that. <laughs> and they have similar food, right? They eat similar food. In fact, squirrel is just like a rat with a bushy tail. So if we don't really understand very well what controls the species-specific rate of aging, but the chances are very high that it is a regulated process, that the aging is controlled, it's regulated. So if you understand the controls, we could then attenuate the process of aging and therefore combat the progression or onset of many bad diseases. So that's kind of the philosophic interpretation or premise upon which the laboratory is operating. So in this review that we published with Tom Rando a while ago, this is the very schematic and good simplistic representation of what happens with aging. If you have young niche, which provides, uh, which were cells of the differentiated organs such as muscle or hippocampus or liver, kidney or skin or hair follicle, provide very good environment for stem cells 
that stem cells then can perform effective tissue repair and reconstruct this young niche when this niche becomes damaged. So when you are young, you exercise and you have little bit aches, and then the next day or the next couple of days, you feel perfect and you have bigger muscle. Then in the old niche, that doesn't happen because now these differentiated cells do not promote effective stem cell responses. So even though the niche is in much need of repair, stem cells are inhibited and then tissue becomes more and more damaged. So when you are old, you go to gym, you work out, and then you have a lot of pain and very little gain. So then the idea that we have been pursuing in our lab and a number of other labs in the United States is to provide some sort of rejuvenation to the stem cells that reside in the old niche. And this rejuvenation have been successfully tested by young blood milieu, by blood sera, for example, or in heterochronic parabiosis, or by defined factors or defined molecules, some of which I will introduce today. So what happens there is that now, since rejuvenated stem cells, stem cell can repair tissues more effectively, and with time, the niche or differentiated tissue will become less damaged and will not any longer inhibit stem cell responses. So the overarching idea is that you need only transient activation of stem cell and once niche is rejuvenated, your intervention will be needed less and less. So it is not that you have to take a pill every day, it's most likely that you will have some sort of um, therapy maybe once or twice a year at some point. And again, all of these dates are just how many and how often are just pure imagination of my brain. But the, the um, model is still accurate that once you rejuvenate stem cells, stem cells will make new younger tissue and that tissue will stop inhibiting them. So you kind of break the downward spiral of tissue degeneration with aging. So this is uh, that brings me to the experimental system, which I will discuss today. And this experimental system is regeneration of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the organ, which is actually pretty numerous. We have approximately 40 kilograms of skeletal muscle when we are adults. So 40 kilograms would be like 60 pounds, probably 70 pounds. And skeletal muscle is the organ which allows us to move voluntarily. Each skeletal muscle cell is called muscle fiber, and it is composed of many cells which have fused together. So in length, it will be pretty long. It will be, I don't know, up to 100 microns or so. And in diameter, it will be just maybe 20 or 50 microns, 20 microns on average to 40 microns, like a cell diameter. And then on top of the base of the plasma membrane of each muscle fiber and underneath basal lamina made of extracellular matrix proteins uh, reside muscle stem cells, also called satellite cells. These house cells have been identified long time ago, starting from 1960s, based on their position. And when muscle is injured, the cells get to work and they make new muscle fiber. And here you see the confocal image of single muscle fiber, where basement membrane is shown in green and cell nuclei are shown in red. Maybe this cell is muscle stem cell or this cell, little cell, kind of jumped into ECM, and these bigger cells are probably myonuclei. So in our lab, uh, we have developed, we have an injury model of muscle where you can inject cardiotoxin into muscle, and cardiotoxin is a snake venom, so it is as if mice are beaten by snakes a little bit. But it's very, very diluted and tiny injection. And you can see on the one very nice interface between healthy tissue and tissue that you have destroyed. Importantly, when you inject cardiotoxin, you don't kill muscle stem cells, you only kill muscle fibers. So then, by day five after injury in a young mouse, and the same is likely to happen in a young human, you have replacement of injured muscle fibers with newly formed muscle fibers. These muscle fibers are progeny of muscle stem cells that in five days divided and differentiated. And you can see them because they are smaller size and they have centrally located blue nuclei. 
Unfortunately, old injured muscle does not regenerate very well, and injury sites are very often replaced by scarring when fibroblasts in, engage in plan B. If muscle stem cells do not work, you need to fill the wound somehow. So fibroblasts then replace the muscle with fibrosis, and there's lots of infiltrating inflammatory cells. However, in a number of papers published by us, which are listed here, starting from 2003, and in even more papers published by other laboratories, for example, Tom Rando, Andrew Brock, Amy Wager's laboratories, um, you can rejuvenate muscle regeneration, which is shown here on the right. So this muscle is from mouse that is chronologically the same as this one. They are all 22 to 24 months old or two years old. But now you have much better reformation of injured muscle fibers, and you have newly formed muscle fibers with centrally located nuclei. So this is just the representation here, and each one of these individual experiments presents different ways to rejuvenate old muscle. Mm -hmm. Does the amount of inflammation change between the young and old? I mean, that old rejuvenation old? Yes. There is much fewer numbers of infiltrating CD45 positive cells, which are leukocytes, or more specifically, you can measure CD11C infiltrating cells or MAC1 infiltrating cells. And in all of these situations, if you improve muscle repair, inflammation goes down. Is there a mechanism that you learn why you get into the infiltrating We published only one paper in I think it's aging or chemistry and biology, where it is linked to osteopontin levels, where osteopontin basically goes up and induces bad inflammatory response, but then if muscle repairs, osteopontin goes down and inflammation is limited in time. But I'm sure osteopontin is not the only molecule that changes. It's transient. We see it maybe until day 10 or so, day 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we see it. And um, then you see it less and less, but it's hard to tell what you see later because old muscle is typically smaller in size than young muscle and is full of fibrosis anyways, with or without injury. So, so there is much more fat and fibrosis infiltration in old muscle even without injury. So here we see that we see fibrosis where the injury was introduced. But later on, there is some infiltrating fibrosis in fat areas in old muscle. And it's hard to tell, is it where it was injured or is it where it was to begin with? Is that based on a trichrome stain or just how do you monitor the fibrosis? Fibrosis could be identified by either HE or, or trichrome. Males. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so then, yeah, so the, it's typical kind of, you know, age-related phenotype of old muscle is that there is increase in fibrosis and fat that replaces, to some extent, functional tissue, which is typical of old muscle. Because of that, sometimes old muscle is very difficult even to do dissociate enzymatically. It becomes tougher. But fibrosis is not inside muscle fibers. It's in between muscle fibers. It's not inside the muscle. Now, another thing which I want to mention here because of Paula's questions is that when we injure muscle, it is a focal injury. So we approximately injure maybe 40%, maximum 50% of tibialis anterior muscle. If you injure muscle more extensively, muscle repair is finite, finite even in young animals. So at some point, I would imagine that if you injure 90% of the muscle, perhaps regeneration will be worse even in a young mouse, and the difference between young and old will be less. This is the focal injury model. So that brings me to the first ways to rejuvenate muscle repair, which is parabiosis. And parabiotic techniques is actually a very ancient technique. It was first published in 1864 
in French. Um, many different animals have been successfully joined in parabiosis. Quite often, rodents, right? rats, mice, hamsters, and rabbits, but also chickens, and even chicken and quail in egg, and frogs, and even insects. Here you see two houseflies joined in parabiosis. Uh, and even hydra and dogs were attempted to be joined in parabiosis, which I can imagine was a nightmare, <laughs> especially when they woke up. <laughs> And many, many different questions were asked in parabiosis. For example, studies of immune system or tooth decay, responses to radiation. So it is not something that Tom Rando, Mike Convoy, and I have invented. Uh, but it is something that we have applied, I guess, for the first time to understand stem cell aging, specifically aging of stem cells, and potential to rejuvenate stem cells in old animal you know, in the kind of endogenous way. So not making new stem cells go into old organ and work, but reawaken your own stem cells in the old organ to work. So here you see the figure from how these mice look when they're first connected by staples and sutured and parabiosis. And here is much nicer kind of cute picture of these parabiotic mice when they have been already together for a number of weeks. And they actually like each other here. See, they kind of cuddle together. And this is the old mouse. It has been barbered. And this is the younger mouse. And one of the, um, not even anecdotal, but some things that you can notice in parabiosed animals that old animals become better looking in many ways. So their posture becomes better. They are. Uh, hair is glossier and they are more alert. So even though I will tell you about muscle and you know there are a bunch of other papers on other organ rejuvenation, it is uh, kind of, I think, reasonable to assume that parabiosis generally rejuvenates broadly organs and systems in old animal. So this is the paper which we started work in about 2003, 2004, and then published in 2005 in Nature, which basically tells that young systemic milieu broadly rejuvenates and old systemic milieu broadly ages the regenerative performance of tissue stem cells. We published on muscle and liver, but we also had data on brain or neurogenesis, which was conducted with the help of Theo Palmer, who is a neuroscientist at Stanford. And then we had some data on hematopoietic stem cells, which then Amy Wagers inherited and took forward. There is still unknown questions about whether bone marrow becomes rejuvenated by parabiosis or not, but I'm sure the data will come out at some point. Um, and in addition to rejuvenation of tissue repair, so here you see, for example, that when aged mice share blood with each other in this focal muscle injury, muscle injury is replaced again by scarring, and there are very few newly formed muscle fibers, which you can identify by staining for embryonic mice in heavy chain. So when muscle fibers are born, they express embryonic mice in heavy chain for a while. Then they start expressing fetal mice in heavy chain and then adult mice in heavy chain. So here, out of all of this blue sea of nuclei, very few fibers actually are newly formed muscle fibers. But if old mouse is sharing blood with the young mouse, you see basically very good restoration of myogenesis after just one month of sharing blood. And this is, again, focal injury, which we analyze five days after injury. And old muscle, which shares blood with the young muscle, actually, here you do not really see it very much. It is not statistically significant at all. But you see some tiny decline. but old muscle then is much rejuvenated. Very importantly, at this time point, we already knew that one of the reasons that muscle does not regenerate well in old is because notch pathway becomes not activated. So if you imagine that muscle is this long fiber and you injure one part of it, there is a positional cue for muscle stem cells work in that part. And that positional cue is upregulation of notch ligand delta. So it's a very elegant system where near injury, delta is upregulated and activate nearby muscle stem cell. That muscle stem cell repaired, repairs the injury. But everywhere else in your body, muscle was not injured, so delta is not activated and cells remain quiescent. 
So what happens with aging is that notch lag and delta becomes significantly downregulated. It is not expressed enough to trigger notch activation. But if in muscle stem cells in parabiotically connected animals, even though they are old, now myofibers upregulate regulate delta, muscle stem cells upregulate delta, notch is activated, and notch is, you know, is the major factor to promote cell proliferation. And here you can see again that there is a slight decline, which is again not statistically significant, you just barely notice it. So young mouse suffers a little bit from sharing blood with old mouse. And this decline becomes profound and statistically significant in liver. So once again, old liver does not regenerate well, and old liver, which exposed to young blood, does. And then young liver, which regenerates well, now it suffers lack of regeneration because of the old blood. And so in the same submitted manuscript, we also had data on brain saying that neurogenesis declines in the young mouse that shares blood with the old mouse. And neurogenesis just very slightly increase in the old mouse that shares blood with the young mouse. But we had this very vicious neuroscientist reviewer who told us to do five years more of experiments uh, and to prove this point. And so the editor just said, what if you just publish without brain? And we said, go for it. And so, <laughs> and so that's how this paper was published in relatively quick time. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of mm -hmm. uh, You might have called, uh, Yeah. Uh, you compare the There are small differences, but they are not as big as this uh, difference in the regeneration. So we did it many times, and what is important to do is to normalize the numbers of stem cells by the numbers of muscle fibers. Because in the old, muscle becomes very small. So if you just isolate all of the muscle stem cells from like one muscle, you will have much less of them than from young. Because muscle is like one third of the size. But if you now normalize the cells that you derived by the number of muscle fibers, you will say per muscle, they only decline by maybe 10%. And another question is, if you compare the, either the growth hormone or the IGF-1 levels, you see that the muscle stem cells are more active in the growth hormone than the parabiotic. Right. Absolutely, right. Right. Yeah, so the question about just hormones, and it could be also testosterone, estrogen, right, bunch of hormones. I'm sure that they will be higher in a common circulation than in an old animal that is not connected. So there will be a variety of hormones that we know which will be now increased in the old animal that shares blood with the young animal. But we did not really look for those hormones specifically. Okay. We did not. And as far as I know, nobody did. So this experiment is still up for grabs. <coughs> uh huh. Yeah. The stress hormones change in the parabiotic animal in those late levels. Could that be influencing Absolutely, right? So, um, but if I had to guess, I would say that stress, good stress, would, would be a factor, not the bad stress. Because we don't test them right away after they are joined. We test them one month after they have been parabiosed. And when you just look at them, the old mice that parabiosed to other old mice just are sitting in the you know, corner of the cage and do nothing. But old mice parabiosed to young mice are running around with young mice all over the cage and exploring and actually look visibly like, you know, happier. So, <laughs> so I would say that. Uh, we did not really pursue studies of neurogenesis, Tony Weisskerel Laboratory, who actually was our neighbor at Stanford at the time when we were doing this work. So we shared with Tony all of our data on neurogenesis, and I'm very happy that he decided to be interested and continue that to great papers that he published recently. But so he studies neurogenesis, but my critique for Tony's papers, some of his papers, not critique, but one comment was that he had to use pseudoparabiosis. He had to somehow just use straight jackets and put young and old mice together without sharing blood. Because you could see right away that the old mice are happy when they are connected to young mice, 
and they have significant enrichment of their environment. Mm -hmm. activity, it might be true. But I'm wondering if uh, you compare the various the physiological functions in various tissues in the, the older animals, and if that is really the, those the functional decline during aging was improved or not. And the second question is if the, those young animals, mm -hmm. younger animals, the, the function could be the, 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 the worse than the, 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 the before the real. Very, very good, right? So again, up for grabs. So only right now we're starting to think about those and doing at least small animal imaging to look at physiology and gross anatomical changes all over the body of parabionts. Uh, nobody has done it yet. No. Yeah. So I'm curious, have you looked at the number of inflammatory cells in the difference uh, in the old animal that's parabiosed with the young animal during an increase in might be. We, no, we did not look. The only thing we looked at, just with aging, there is more inflammatory cells, much more at the injury site. Actually, inflammatory cells are not bad. They are <laughs> necessary for tissue regeneration. So if you look at three-day post-injury, you see tons of inflammatory cells in both young and old muscles. And that's how it's supposed to be, because they're supposed to clear the dead cells and clear the wound, and secrete lots of interleukins to promote stem cell responses. But then in the young cells, this inflammation goes away by about five days after injury. In the old, in the old tissue, it persists a little longer. And equivalently, the uh, and the suggestion is there's some defined factor in circulation that may be contributing to this improvement, correct? No. <laughs> Actually, so again, what, and thank you for asking these questions because it just saved me like a lot of my concluding slides. But the thing is that you should not oversimplify it because these mice, they do not just share blood, they share a set of organs. So old mouse now benefits from young kidneys, liver, thymus, set of um, <clears throat> heart and lungs, right? And young mouse now has to work hard because these other organs which are potentially pathological are connected to it. So we don't oversimplify it. There could be numerous multi-pronged changes. Is there evidence that there might be cellular sharing of cells, potentially like macrophages? And of course there are. So the way to establish that parabiosis worked is to have tail bleeds. So usually what we do is that one of these mice will be GFP transgene and another would be no transgene. And so you do tail bleeds about you know, seven days to 10 days and you discover that now you have GFP positive blood cells circulating through both mice. But what we know for sure is that those cells do not themselves repair tissues because by the same token, we can section muscle and see how many of these nicely regenerated fibers in the old animal actually produced by young cells, GFP positive cells, and the answer is zero. Yeah, any questions? No? Mm -hmm. One more quick question, sorry, I know you We only did a couple of those experiments, actually, and a while ago, when we were still in Tom's lab. And we know that the effect lasts at least for two weeks, but there are limited ends. So we know that the positive effect lasts for about two weeks, and we did not do more or less. And you know, I just moved on to Berkeley, and we did other stuff. OK, so moving, moving on. So now, how do we connect what we know about circulation changes with what we know about what happens inside muscle cells? And the idea would be that there are some, some changes in the circulation which account for better performance or worse performance of muscle stem cells. So this, again, um, a schematic from our review with Tom, summarizes what we know about signal transduction during tissue repair or muscle stem cell in young versus old muscle. So in young muscle, injury activates delta notch pathway. And our more recent work shows that it probably works through MAP kinase. MAP kinase, in many evolutionary distinct species, results in upregulation of notch ligand delta. And so it probably does during muscle injury and repair. So then, notch promotes breakage of quiescence 
and muscle stem cells, which are typically quiescent. So right now, in all of you, they are not dividing. They start dividing. They divide, divide, divide. And during their divisions, they divide asymmetrically, such as that in cells which maintain high notch activity, they continue to divide. But cells which now upregulate wind start differentiating. And so the cells which upregulate wind and downregulate notch activation then fuse together and form newly, newly formed de novo muscle fiber or myotube. So that's what happens, and that is very positive. So it's homeostasis between notch and wind controls muscle cell fate from division to differentiation, and injury activates delta notch through MAP kinase, and that's how cells break quiescence and start dividing in the first place. Now, with aging, first of all, delta notch activation becomes ineffective, and there is not much MAP kinase, phosphoerc activation. And there is tons of TGF beta in the old muscle and also in old blood circulation. So TGF beta inhibits proliferation of quiescent stem cells, which remain quiescent. So because that step is inhibited, nothing else happens. So there is no newly formed muscle fibers. Now, wind in aging, because it was positive in young muscle where it promoted margining differentiation, in the old muscle, it actually promotes fibrosis, which was published by Andrew Bragg in Tom Randall lab. So that's what happens. And then we identified TGF beta as one of the factors which is increased in old <laughs> circulation. And also, it is increased in old muscle. Although we do not necessarily know is it primarily come from macrophages or fibroblasts in old muscle or muscle stem cells or combination of all. And then quite recently, we identified the first juvenile factor, which now decreases with age, which is called oxytocin. And moreover, oxytocin can positively activate MAP kinase phosphoric signaling, which is lacking with aging. So that was our um, candidate for the systemic factor that perhaps we need to add back. And on TGA beta, we published a number of papers saying this is systemic factor and also local factor which you need to antagonize. So for TGA beta, this, these results have been published a while ago in 2009. And it shows that if you look at the systemic levels of TGA beta, if you just look at the serum, or it will be similar if you look at plasma levels, except in plasma, there's almost no TGA beta. But if you look at um, different ages of mice, you see increase in TGA beta with age. So these are months. And then this is the data which was contributed by um, Professor Agrawal from UC Irvine, who did this work on human blood. And you see that it's kind of similar. So these are ages of humans. You see a similar increase in kind of average levels of TGA beta with age in humans. So then we published a number of papers where you can deliver the antagonist of TGA beta and by that improve muscle regeneration very quickly in about a couple of weeks in the old animals. So now that brings me to the oxytocin part, which has been published last June in Nature Communications. So if you look at oxytocin levels, you see about threefold decline in plasma of old mice as compared to young. And if you look at oxytocin receptor levels, they also decline in the muscle stem cells as compared to young. However, they do not change in muscle fibers. So muscle fibers have oxytocin receptor and muscle stem cells, but muscle stem cells experience decline with age, but not muscle fibers. So both the, the hormone or ligand and the receptor decline with age. So it's kind of double whammy. And very interestingly, for TGF beta, the opposite is also true. TGF beta levels go up with age, and TGF beta receptor levels go up with age on the muscle stem cells. So we were kind of thinking that perhaps it's a general phenomena that when you have deregulation of the hormone, its receptor also follows the deregulation. But importantly, the receptor is still there in all the just ah, about maybe twofold less, 40% less. So then what we typically do, we try to rejuvenate the tissue response. And very often, we, either when we use parabiosis or you inject something directly at the muscle site, it's a little bit less translational approaches. 
But oxytocin is already FDA approved by a number of different applications. And here what we did, we introduced daily subcutaneously oxytocin or oxytocin antagonists or the buffer, HBSS. And we started four days before focal injury bug cardiotoxin daily. And then we continued for another five days after cardiotoxin injury. And then our measurement was at five days after injury, we did our conventional assay when we do sections of muscle, and we see what happens. So here you have a representative pictures where old vehicle looks much worse than young vehicle. So either you measure the H&E and you look at fibrosis, which shown here, it looks like white areas. And regenerated muscle, you can clearly see newly formed muscle fibers. Or if you look at myosin heavy chain, which is embryonic form, only expressed in newly formed muscle fibers, you see that there are fewer muscle fibers, and each muscle fiber is actually smaller than in the young. But in mice which have experienced oxytocin delivery systemically, subcutaneously, so we did not inject it into muscle, we injected it into sub-Q, right? So it went into circulation. You now have much better muscle regeneration, and um, young mice which received oxytocin are not different from the young control mice, but young mice which got oxytocin antagonist, OTA, now look pretty much like old mice, and that happened just in nine days. So you don't need two years to age, you can actually experience degenerative decline if you inhibit specific signaling pathway in just nine days. Once again, this kind of empty area represents fibrosis, which we also quantified by doing uh, trichrome staining, specifically as fibrotic index. And you can only also quantify newly formed fibers per millimeter of square millimeter of injury. And in this quantification, you don't just base it on one or two sections, you actually quantify number of muscle fibers throughout the injury site, which is very, very important because as we also discussed with Paula, in every young and old muscle, there are good areas and bad areas. So your data could be very easily and inadvertently skewed if you just look at a couple of sections. You pretty much need to section the entire TA muscle and figure out how many, how many new muscle fibers have been formed. So this, is, this tells you how many new muscle fibers have been formed per millimeter of injury. And you can see that in a young vehicle compared to old, ve old vehicle, there has been decline. And old oxytocin injected mice or administered mice are now better, but they are not at young levels yet. And then uh, mice which are young but now have experienced oxytocin antagonists look pretty much like old control mice. There is no statistical significance between this bar and this bar. And then fibrotic index is the mirror image or reverse image of muscle regeneration. So wherever you have better muscle regeneration, you have less fibrosis. Worse muscle regeneration, you have more fibrosis and so forth. Yeah. Right. So basically, the way that we uh, use our doses, they are super optimal. So are not, they are not similar to any physiological dose that you can. They are not identical to physiological dose. But when you get the product oxytocin, they tell you what the half maximum effective dose is, and we use the half maximum effective dose of the of the hormone or or antagonist. Right. And again, it could be, you know, then titrated down or up. We just use one dose. Right. So then, uh, to be thorough, we also looked a little bit earlier at three days after injury. So muscle has newly formed muscle fibers by five days, but by three days after injury, you're supposed to see proliferating muscle progenitor cells. So you start with quiescent cells, then they divide, and then they differentiate into newly formed muscle fibers. So then when you do that, and again, this is muscle sections, and this is um, enlarged area, you can stain cells for desmin, which will brightly stain only myoblasts at this point. And then also for BRDU, and you can quantify how many of BRDU positive, desmin positive cells you have. And that just gives you a more complete picture, not just you formed better muscle fibers, but you also have higher proliferation of muscle stem cells that differentiate it into muscle progenitor cells. So then um, this is pretty much similar experiment, except we analyze 
sections at three day post injury, and BRDU is introduced in vivo into mice just for a couple of hours before they are sucked. So we are measuring cells that proliferate in vivo, that incorporated BRDU in vivo. So then what you see again, that there is a decline in proliferation, and that is again not novel data that has been published many times before. There is a decline in proliferation of muscle progenitor cells with age. Um, here, big decline. And then when you treat mice with oxytocin, you recover their proliferative capacity to some degree, but it is still worse than young cells. So then we decided to analyze this um, phenotype of cells in a little bit more uh, detail, and also ask a very simple question that oxytocin is known in different cell types to activate phosphoerg, and we wanted to see if we treat cells with oxytocin, but inhibit MAP kinase signaling, will we still see effect or not? So our hypothesis was that oxytocin activates MAP kinase phosphoerg, and that's how cells become proliferating better and also repairing muscle. So then uh, here you see Ki67, numbers of muscle stem cells, and the reverse uh, experiment is P21. So we test both kind of positive and negative um, parameter of cell proliferation. And what you can see is that young are all in empty bars and old are in um, black bars. So what you can see is that you see decline in proliferation of muscle stem cells with age. But then if you treat cells with oxytocin, even old cells can proliferate well. But if you treat cells with oxytocin and inhibit MAP kinase with MAC inhibitor, now oxytocin positive effect is lost. It doesn't work. It looks exactly the same as nothing or MAC inhibitor alone. And you can also decrease proliferation of even young cells if you add MAC inhibitor. Showing that really MAP kinase phosphoric signaling is very much needed for other young or old cells to proliferate. And at the very end of my talk, I will just show you the data which is not yet published. The manuscript is coming in the next couple of days, explaining why we believe MAP kinase signaling is needed for cell proliferation in the muscle. And then um, P21 is pretty much reciprocal of Ki67, which is also good. It's just another confirmation. So you have less P21 in the young as compared to old. P21 levels go down with oxytocin, but not if MAP kinase is also inhibited. Um, and then if you simply isolate muscle stem cells, so these are all freshly isolated muscle stem cells treated overnight in culture. So this is not in vivo. This is stem cells derived from in vivo uh, three days after injury and then treated with oxytocin or MAC inhibitor in culture just overnight. And then if you look at the activation of phosphoerg, you see very rapid, so this is untreated, you see very rapid activation of phosphoerg by oxytocin, which completely abolished by uh, MAC inhibitor. And this rapid activation then kind of decays a little bit or maybe plateaus after five minutes, which is known for this signaling pathway. So that brings me to oxytocin knockout mice which are all summarized here in this one slide with a couple of movies. So then um, we had oxytocin knockout animals, and we studied mostly male animals. And what you can see is that this is at one year of age. At one year of age, you can see dramatic difference in muscle regeneration or decline in animals which do not have oxytocin. So again, there is more fibrosis or white areas and there are less of the MHC, embryonic mice that have chain positive fibers. Interestingly, there is no statistical significant decline at three months of age when animals are young, but it becomes statistically significant by one year of age. And the same is true if you just count numbers of the proliferating BRDU positive, Desmond positive muscle progenitor cells, there is a decline by about one year of age in the knockout. Typically, one year old or adult male mouse is not different from three months old mouse. We don't see significant decline in either formation of the new muscle fibers or properties of muscle stem cells. But here what we detect is premature aging. 
which is very interesting because to my knowledge is the only single gene, gene knockout which does not change embryonic development or early early muscle properties in early life and specifically is noticeable only in the adulthood. So it accelerates process of aging from adult animal to old animal. So yeah. Very good question, and uh, we had to discuss it in our paper. And the answer would be because there is more growth hormone and IGF-1 in the young animal. And oxytocin is not the only ligand which can activate MAP kinase signaling. And then when those other hormones go down, oxytocin becomes more important. I don't even know if it's growth hormone. I just know that in a young animal, there are so many other positive pro proliferative factors that defect in oxytocin might not be noticeable. It's compensated for. And then when those factors also decline with aging or TGA beta rises, for example, then the balance between activation of notch and activation of TGA beta becomes critical. And then every single knockout now is noticeable. And you are right that it's not that they do not exist. It's just in our assay, we do not notice them. Yeah. It probably does. And we have the entire kind of uh, little study on whether the molecules we find on aging also have effect or positive effect or negative on diabetes progression. And the answer is yes. In many cases, the molecules which we find, which we modulate them, then rejuvenate muscle, they also combat muscle wasting and diabetes. But we did not look at it in enough detail. It really was a back burner kind of study. We published just like one or two papers on that. So then, with respect to um, how muscle look and fibrosis and replacement with fat, so. When you just look at muscle, you can clearly see that in the knockout, you have pretty much loss. So this, there will be TA and uh, EDL muscle, and you have loss of those muscle. You have also more accumulation of the intramuscular fat. And it's pretty much for every single muscle group, and even for peritoneal fat. So knockout oxytocin mice age prematurely, even with respect to their fat accumulation. They become bigger and fatter. and um, many of the old mice become fat. So then this is our only study with actually female mice and that addresses their um, strength and agility. And this is the knockout mouse, this is the knockout mouse, and this is the wild type female mouse of age matched and it's about one year old, each mouse. And so female mice, our preliminary work in progress that is not yet published shows that oxytocin knockout is also deleterious for female mice even sometimes more severely than for males, but in a different, a little bit different subset of parameters. So here I will try to show you their strength in a very simple experiment here. Yeah, so they cannot grab. And in the second uh, movie, the knockout will try to grab longer and it will wrap even its tail over the wild type trying to hang on and then, but then it will be all futile. It grabs the tail, and it, it waves the tail. Huh? The movie is not continuing. Huh? Let's see. Maybe close ammo here. Eventually, it drops on on the table. So. <laughs> yeah. No, see, this is almost. It's like ah, oh, and then. <laughs> <laughs> in a second, it will go on, <laughs> go down. Uh, but that's pretty much like the only data I really have now. This work is completely unpublished and is still ongoing. So that brings me to the next um, chunk of my talk. Just a couple of slides, but they are kind of complicated slides. And that is the work that we published in PLOS One in 2013. 
And it addresses DNA damage accumulation in young versus old muscle stem cells. And the reason we approach this question is because what if you boost proliferative capacity of young muscle stem, or old muscle stem cells like everybody tries to do, but they accumulated tons of DNA damage, and then when they, you make them proliferate, they will form mutations and then form tissue with genomic instability, and nothing good will happen, right? So because of that, we had this project for a while in a lab, and what is shown here is simply our ability to detect a particular type of DNA damage, which is double strand breaks, which we detect by the presence of gamma H2X, which is a particular um, form of H2AX. And this is specific antibody, so you see this very nice, beautiful foci. And what is interesting is that when you isolate muscle stem cells or progenitor cells after injury, you have a variety of cells, number of cells. Some of them have very few foci, and some of them have tons of foci. So there is a huge heterogeneity to begin with. But when you try to compare young and old, you don't see any age-specific accumulation of DNA damage. Whether you bin them into 0 to 5 foci to more than 30 foci, you kind of do not see any increase with age. Or if you actually quantify all of the average, all of the cells with the gamma H2X positive nuclei as a percent. Again, there is no increase with aging. In this specific double strand break, DNA damage. As a positive control, which worked for us, we use skid mice. And skid mice, in addition to being immunodeficient, they have a mutation in one of the enzymes which repair DNA, so they accumulate DNA damage, which has been known for years. So skid mice really have more DNA damage by these parameters, but not old 57 mice as compared to young. So that is good and quite interesting. So then, when we analyzed muscle stem cells isolated from un uninjured muscle versus isolated at 12 hours, 24 hours, and 36 hours after injury when they have to get working to repair the injury, what we found was very interesting. We found that accumulation of DNA damage, double strand breaks, rises significantly when cells go from quiescence to proliferation. But again, that does not differ between young and old cells. So it is not the age of the cell which results in a higher damage, but it is the cell fate which results in higher damage. So when cells break quiescence and become progenitor cells, they for some reason accumulate DNA damage, which we don't know really yet the reason. Uh, to prove that it is not just gamma, H, uh, gamma uh, H2X, immunofluorescence, but it is DNA damage. We also confirm this by staining with 53BP1, which is another molecule accumulated at the sites of the double strand DNA breaks. And the results were again the same, no age-specific difference. Uh, so then, I'm skipping a couple of slides because the transition from Mac to PC made them all screwy. So I will just tell you right away what happened. So then we irradiated young and old cells and we asked them to repair their DNA and form myogenic colonies. And again, there was no difference between young and old. And skids again were much, much worse in the recovery from gamma radiation. And by no difference, I mean that if you normalize the results by non-irradiated cells, old cells did not do worse than young. And then this is the clincher. So basically then you ask the question, is there any correlation between ability to repair DNA damage and ability to regenerate tissue? And here the answer is no, which is very surprising. So this is the familiar to your picture. This is again a focal injury assessed five days after injury in the young versus old animal. In the young, focal injury is repaired very well by newly formed muscle fibers. In old, it is not repaired very well. And skid mice, which do not repair DNA damage, they accumulate DNA damage, young skid mice repair their, D, their muscle injury almost as good or even better than young wild-type mice and much better than the old C57 mice. And again, like there's some of the data missing, which is bar quantification because of the transition from Mac to PC, but this data is all published, so you can just look up uh, plus one Kaizen et al. from June 2013, and you will see the entire paper. 
So that kind of is very interesting. It tells that it's not really linked. The ability to repair DNA damage or accumulate DNA damage is not directly correlated with the ability of stem cells to work. There is no direct correlation. And chances that there is no direct correlation could be very sim simply that our cells are not typically challenged to accumulate so much DNA damage that they are incapable to work, especially not in muscle. When we gamma irradiate them, we see that they are challenged and they don't work. But when they are ordinary cells, we don't see that. But anyway, so conclusions are very good and positive for people like myself and others who try to boost regenerative potential of muscle stem cells and all is that if you do it, the cells do not have much DNA damage. Another paper we published, they also have nice telomerase activity, which is tightly regulated, and so they will make good tissue. So that brings me to the very last part of my talk, which deals with the key fundamental concept. And the concept is the following. We all believe that with age, muscle stem cells remain in the muscle, but fail to divide. However, there have been recent paper from Andrew Black, Black Laboratory saying that, no, no, no. What happens with age is muscle stem cells hyperproliferate without any injury, and then are actually gone somehow. So it is illustrated here. So what we believed is that in old, muscle stem cells fail to activate and proliferate in response to injury. In the young, they proliferate and then differentiate and repair the injury. But yet, the alternative model for the old was the muscle stem cells in the old actually hyperproliferate without injury. Then they are gone somehow because of that. And that hyperproliferation is related to upregulation of FGF2. So because this is the key thing that we have been doing for years, then it was very important for us to address. And my next about three or four slides will address that. So um, first set of data which we published in aging in 2013 shows, first of all, that if you um, look at muscle stem cells or muscle fibers from young and old animals, you can see clear, clear upregulation of FGF2 with age which is very, very interesting. You have tons more FGF2 with age. Totally reproducible in this regard. However, if you look at phosphorc in muscle stem cells, you don't see any. Either they come from young animals or old animals. And these are quiescent, non-injured muscle. We had to do positive control, which is myoblast, just to show that we can detect phosphorc. And this is quantification. So there is FGF2, but it doesn't mean that it acts to activate phosphorc. Then to address that, we looked at the sections, and it seemed to us that in the young muscle sections, FGF2 is located in the basement membrane, where growth factors typically are, and satellite cells are. But in the old muscle, it's kind of located all over the place, not really making this nice basement membrane outlines, which is kind of quantified here. So it's in the membrane of young muscle, not in the fiber itself. And in the old, it kind of mislocalized or perhaps is not secreted well. But it's not, of course, a complete answer. It's just some age-specific difference. So then we just looked at the cell proliferation. And we cannot repeat that muscle stem cells in the old muscle hyperproliferate. They definitely do not hyperproliferate. So here we can look at Ki67, Pax7, costain of young and old. And then you can quantify those few cells, and either without FGF2 or with ectopic FGF2. So the first thing, and these cells, again, they are isolated from non-injured muscle. They are all muscle stem cells. They are all Pax7 positive. And they are plated overnight with or without FGF. And they are plated, um, when, when you do that, they are plated with their own mouse sera, so they don't have any other mitogens. They are plated in basal media with a little bit of their own mouse sera. So when you do that, first of all, you see that the cells are quiescent. You can only see overnight 4% of them divide in the young and about 1% in the old, so they don't all proliferate, and they typically do not proliferate at all. They are quiescent. And then if you add FGF, you see some increase. Now young and old become very similar to each other with FGF2. But once again, you did not induce proliferation of more than 10% of cells. And that actually tells an interesting story. It tells that not only cells are quiescent, 
but they are unresponsive largely to FGF2 when you isolate them from non-injured muscle. They do not have phosphate org, and when you try to treat them with FGF2, they don't want to do anything. So that was okay. So that's what we published, and then the paper which is coming out, um, or maybe it already came out, or is coming out in the next couple of days, deals with the injury activated muscle stem cells and explores what phosphate org does really in young and old stem cells. Why does it? Why is it needed, perhaps, to boost stem cell proliferation? So um, once again, in 3D post-injury muscle fiber, you see tons more of FGF2 in old, very robust as compared to young. Now, if you look at cells which have been activated by muscle injury, there is phospho-ERK, but there is no age-specific difference. So if you injure muscle, there are some other things outside of FGF2 which activate phospho-ERK, and there is no difference between young and old. And now the same situation is repeated if you look at muscle stem cells. In the uninjured situation, there is some FGF2 in the muscle stem cell, but no phospho-ERK. When you injured muscle, muscle stem cells upregulate phospho-ERK, and if you quantify it, there is no statistical significant difference between young and old just shown here. But there is difference between uninjured and injured. And again, um, FGF2 is upregulated much more in old as compared to young. So then we wanted to see if cells actually have functional MAP kinase pathway. What if we isolate them and treat them with, with FGF2 in culture? Can we then trigger phosphate work? And we can. So what is shown here is that if you have young cells and you give FGF2 to them, now you can actually identify FGF2, which bounds to FGF2 receptors on the cell surface. The same will happen if you treat old cells with FGF2. And if you treat them with FGF2, you activate phospho-ERK as you're supposed to. So it tells that young and old cells have intact MAP kinase signaling pathway, so you can add ectopic FGF2 and they will activate phospho-ERK. And again, on the right is just quantification of multiple experiments. And that's very pleasant intermission <laughs> music. Uh, so then the interesting thing is now, if you look at cell proliferation, as we and others published uh, many times, young cells proliferate better than old. So I don't know if you see enough of it. Um, but so young cells proliferate better than old. And then if you inhibit MAP kinase signaling, both young and old cells proliferate less. If you treat cells with FGF2, now old cells start proliferating as good as young, and young cells already proliferated very well, so additional FGF2 is not important for them. And then if you have FGF2 in my inhibitor, you see a slight decline in this proliferation, saying that some at least effects of FGF2 were through MAP kinase signaling. So, um, there was also some indications in literature, and this I will just summarize very quickly, even though it looks like a complicated slide, but it is not. But there are some indications that muscle stem cells with age change their cell, their cell fate. They become fibroblast. So it is not that fibroblast expand, but actually instead of muscle cell fate, they become fibrotic. We did not see it, so all of this is to look at the Pac-7, in the muscle stem cells and myosin heavy chain and myogenin in their progeny to say that whether or not cells divide well or poorly, they do not change their cell fate. They do not. They remain, remain equally Pac-7 expressing <coughs> cells or differentiate into equally my, myosin heavy chain and myogenin expressing myotubes. And that is the summary, right? So they really only depend on the ability to divide. Once you make them to divide, they will make correct choices. And then, um, then we decided to look into more detail at what happens to CDK inhibitors like P21 and P16 in young versus old cells. Do old cells fail to proliferate because, for example, they upregulate quiescence, uh, check, um, Checkpoint P21 or senescence specific marker and effector P16. 
So what you can see here is that uh, P21 levels, and this is um, RT-PCR, quantitative RT-PCR, and this is Western blotting. So P21, mRNA, and protein levels increase with age dramatically. And FGF can diminish P21 levels in mRNA and in protein in the old animals. And this positive effect uh, disappears, a little bit at least, but statistically significant when you inhibit MAP kinase signaling, saying that FGF2 works through phosphorc and downregulates P21 in old stem cells. And if you look at P16, P16 levels also are increased in mRNA and in protein in muscle stem cells isolated from two-year-old animals. And perhaps FGF2 tries to do something but just does not do it enough. So it, FGF2 is capable of downregulating P21 but not P16. So we need something else to do if we want to downregulate in essence. Now, that is, has another implication that if you, for example, a company that looks for ablating senescent cells based on P16 expression, perhaps you need to look for another combination of things because if you just ablate based on P16 expression, you might get rid of your muscle stem cells. And we also, in this paper, published that the same happens to muscle fibers. So senescence might be continuum. It might be something that is upregulated not just in the groups of bad fibroblasts in different tissues or in other stroma cells, but also upregulated in the working cells with aging. And I don't show it here, but we have the data in the paper that the same applies to other CDK inhibitors such as P15, P27. But not all of them are downregulated in a MAP kinase related fashion, but all of them are upregulated with aging in muscle stem cells. So that brings me to this very favorite figure. When you have a figure like that, it's like nothing, nothing, yes, nothing, 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 yes. Then it's kind of really <laughs> interesting and typically cool data or good data. So what we did here, we did the cheap assay when we wanted to see if phosphorc can be found on the P21 and P16 promoters. And phosphorc, of course, is not a transcriptional factor, but it is known to translocate into the nucleus and then uh, uh, phosphorylate various proteins. So it was not completely unrealistic to be able to detect it in association with promoters or DNA. So what you can see here is that phosphorylate does associate with P21 and P16 promoter regions only when we treat cells with FGF2 and only when cells are old. So if you look at young and old muscle stem cells and do cheap with phosphorylate, you can find it on the promoters of CDK inhibitors, but only in old cells, not in the young cells, and only when cells are treated with FGF2. And that is just to show that um, P21 levels are also reduced in old cells by FGF2 when we use report reconstruct. And that was a reviewer question. Can you do some GFP or luciferase report and to show that if cells are treated with FGF2, P21 reporting will go down. Muscle cells, muscle stem cells, in fact. So what our lab is good at is to getting muscle stem cells pure at different time points after injury or not injury at all. So the, yeah. Are these, are these primary cells or cell lines? Very primary, so they have been in, in the muscle of the mouse three days before. These cells are isolated from injured muscle of mice three days after injury, treated with, with FGF2 overnight or not treated with FGF2 overnight. They are not lines of primary cells. They are not maintained. Yeah? Well, I know when you, you know, at least in our level, when you lose, you have to keep basic FGF2. Mm -hmm. you that is true. Yeah. So then what is your question? So this culture has, let's see, this culture does not have basic FGF. This culture does not have basic FGF and has MIC inhibitor. This culture has basic FGF. This culture has basic FGF and MIC inhibitor. So are you using a purple gradient or how are you getting out your myogenic cells? I mean, when you isolate the cells and you plate them, you, you take the muscle units 
it up, you digest it, and you put it in a first called gradient, or how do you do that? Oh, the, the methods for isolation of muscle stem cells and, and checks for their purity is routinely published in our methods of every paper. And they're published in this paper, they're published. We publish also methods in molecular biology, which is very, you know, involved, long procedure. So if it's okay, I will tell you at the dinner, or I will actually send to your lab, okay? But um, our preparations are about 95% pure and not different between young and old. So if you do like a routine functional check, so in aliquot of the cells, we played for differentiation into my tubes. And then we see how many, therefore, contaminating cells versus margining cells we have. And those are also published in our supplementary figures. But I totally agree. And the reason that we're looking at FGF2, because typically all over the world, when people try to establish primary margining cell lines, FGF2 is the key ingredient in the medium. And so do we, right? But yet it was shown to be a bad guy in aging by Andrew Brock saying that you don't want it, so there is discrepancy. Do you want it or you don't want it? So these are in vivo cells. They come from injured muscle three days after injury. They're cultured in their own serum, with or without all of these conditions, and then lies the next morning for chip, for chromatin immune precipitation. OK. But, so that was interesting. So then, of course, like being very kind of, you know, straightforward, me and my postdoc discussed why phosphoric will not bind to young promoters. And we decided that young CDK inhibitor, inhibitor promoters are probably epigenetically closed and nothing can bind to them. So as you know, promoters can be modified on histone H3 and if lysine 4 is trimethylated, that signifies open conformation, and if, and if lysine 27 is trimethylated, it signifies closed conformation. So the simple idea was that phosphoric tries, it goes into the nucleus of both young and old cells, and in old cells, P21 and P16 promoters are open, so it goes and binds there, in association with other proteins. In the young cells, the loci are closed epigenetically, so, no, so nothing can bind, not even phosphoric. So then we checked it, and it turned out to be true, which is shown on this figure. And I think this is like was my last figure. It's shown to be true. So what you see here is that if you look at the trimethylated K4 versus K27, so this is open conformation, this is closed conformation, you have much more um, um, in the young, you have much more closed conformation than open on the P21 area. So this is a chromatin immunoprecipitation assay when, we, when they actually precipitate with H3K4 trimethylated antibody or H3K27 trimethylated antibody, right? And then we do the amplification of the region. So yeah, so then with the FGF2 for young, situation does not change dramatically. You still have, and you had before, the closed conformation of the promoters. Now, if you look at old control, look, now we have much more of the open conformation. It looks almost bivalent, almost even, right? And then when you have FGF2, you now change the conformation or epigenetic status on P21 promoter closer to the young status. It's pretty much the same as young control. And when we look at P16, quite interestingly, we have similar situations. So young, you have P16 in a close conformation as compared to um, activating form. And then old control, you have now more active than inactive confirmation. And this is, again, population of cells, right? It's no single cell analysis. FGF2 does seem to significantly diminish activating form, but it is still higher than in the young. So it seems that we explained, at least to the first level of approximation, why phosphor binds only in the old satellite cells to CDK inhibitor promoters. But we still don't know why P21 is downregulated by phosphor and PC, or FGF2, and P16 is not that much. Presumably, something else is needed. And so then, this is the very last slide. And then we discussed all of this with Tom Randall, who is my now dear friend and <laughs> collaborator and wonderful PI in the past. And he told us about this paper that he published just about at the same time on Cell Reports, uh, where they did single cell muscle stem cell analysis for a number of genes. And 
for epigenome. Epigenetic changes with aging on a number of loci. So then we uh, data mined existing database for P21 and P16, and we published with his acknowledgement um, this figure in our paper, which shows that basically, so this is the, um, let's see. So, um, so if you look at these big peaks, it means that you have enrichment for the inactivated form, inactive form of the gene. So the higher peaks you have, the more enrichment of an active form you have. Um, right? Or let me just get my bearings here because I don't actually see very well what is written here. OK, so K27 metal 3 is in red. And then K4 is in green. Yeah, so then what you see is that on top you have young cells. And on the bottom, you have all cells. And you see that for the huge chunk of P16 chromosomal location, all of these loci seem to be in a more closed conformation in the young cells as compared to old. So they are much more open in old, because you see almost no peaks here, than in the young. So this epigenetic locus in a huge chunk of the chromosome is closed in the young cell. Therefore, CDK inhibitor expression or P16 expression, and the same is true actually for P21, it's just not as pronounced. Is not, young cells are not prone to express the CDK inhibitors. They epigenetically silence them. And old cells are prone to express those CDK inhibitors. The chromatin status there is that of an active chromatin. And that is very ironic because even before injury happened, it seems that old cells are predisposed not to divide it's more difficult to push them over threshold and make them to divide. So then when injury signals come, young cells start dividing and old cells, no, no, we don't want to divide. And maybe there is some evolutionary advantage to that, but we yet don't know what it is. So that pretty much brings me to my conclusions. And what I told you is that, first of all, all stem cells persist in the old and have largely intact capacity for tissue repair. And that has been proven by many, many parabiotic experiments and other ways, HDF11 and whatnot, to rejuvenate them. That happens very quickly. These cells are acutely inhibited by their aged organismal niches. Some of these niches could be proteins that circulate in old blood. Um, others could be, for example, deregulation of normal, normal metabolism, lower insulin levels, lower oxygenation of blood and simple things, which also change in parabiosis. Now, we published that old cells do not accumulate DNA damage, but they upregulate CDK inhibitors. And this upregulation is for multiple inhibitors, all the ones that we tested, both at genetic and epigenetic levels. And FGF2 phosphoric reverses some of the CDK elevation, and perhaps that's why we keep it in our culture medium to derive and to grow primary uh, muscle cells because we need to keep CDK inhibitors levels down. Rejuvenation of systemic milieu yields youthful tissue regeneration. And furthermore, successful transplantation or cell uh, therapies in older individuals will probably need to address the point that I have raised here, that we don't just put young cells into old environment and believe that they will work. So then the challenges. So we need more quantitative accurate methods of analysis. And so we work on small animal MRI, CT scan, and so forth methods that you also have and use here very nicely. Then now, among all of these methods, what is FDA approved or clinically feasible or could be FDA approved soon? And finally, what is concerned between mice and humans? So we have several grant applications, which hopefully will be soon funded to address some of these challenges. And uh, finally, <laughs> um, I would like to show a photograph of my laboratory. And I've showed the work of Wendy Kaisen and Christian Lab, those two guys, who published wonderful papers, the best papers of my lab in the past five years. And Christian now found a job, but Wendy is on the market, and I highly recommend her as an assistant professor. She would be wonderful. And then some of the work was done by Michelle Ho, and uh, Mike Convoy shown here, Jamin Jeong. And so this work was supported by National Institute of Aging, CRM, KEAG, Ellison Medical Foundation, and Sense Foundation. And I thank you again for your attention. Right. 
So, so of course, like for muscle to regenerate, you cannot just activate muscle stem cells. Because what happens, tissue becomes remodeled, it becomes re-innervated, so new neuromuscular junctions are formed, and it becomes revascularized, so new blood vessels are formed. But if muscle stem cells do not work, and you replace functional muscle with fibrosis, scar, and inflammation, there is no vascularization, and there is no re-innervation. Right. So is it coupled with the sort of the regeneration? I mean, so I think since you know Theo's work, I mean, he has shown that there, that neurogenesis and angiogenesis are coupled together. Right. Uh -huh. And they're required for each other. And so I'm just curious if it's a similar relationship in the skeleton. Right, absolutely. And because of that, so, um, so Paul left, but I'm sure we'll discuss at the dinner. It is important to know that we do focal muscle injury. So for our focal muscle injury, we do not challenge vascularization that much, which certainly is worse than old than the young, right? If you do bigger injury, we probably should do different assays to answer our questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the major growth factor for the muscle proliferation and also defense? One is TGF beta, which is inhibitor or myostatin, which is muscle-specific to beta family member, which is also inhibitor. The positive factor is notch, so it's local. It is not, does not come from circulation. Delta is activated right there. Then uh, wind and notch interplay in muscle stem cells themselves. And those are the ones which we know. We so don't know. They are probably player in a different aspect. So muscle can grow by regeneration or by hypertrophy. Right. Well, IGF-1 and growth hormone are important for hypertrophy, which is protein and DNA synthesis by the muscle fiber. So, but they don't they play a role in the, the stem cell proliferation. I don't know. <laughs> Not that much. <laughs> I don't know, seriously, because uh, you know the way that we started to approach the myogenesis in adults is to see, does it recapitulate embryonic muscle formation? So we are, we are looking at developmentally conserved signaling pathways. Now, what I have learned during that, that just studying about muscle is that there is another aspect, which is hypertrophy. And IGF-1 growth hormone has been extensively studied with respect to muscle hypertrophy. Do they activate proliferation of muscle stem cells? Maybe, I don't know. It is not published. That, yes. No, and it was not really true chip seek. <laughs> because we just did amplification of P21 promoter and P16 promoter. It was not sequencing everything. But to look at the targets of oxytocin in young versus old muscle stem cells is, of course, our very next thing that, and again, if I do get well-funded or <laughs> some, then we will proceed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm intrigued by the oxytocin story. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if it's paracrine or endocrine? It's secreted by brain. And it works there, and it also is endocrine. So, yeah, it is endocrine, so it is present in the circulation, right? right? But with respect to which tissue makes oxytocin, what is known is brain. But Muscles should not make oxytocin. The reason I ask is uh, many years ago, uh, you know, attempting to uh, establish kinesis for induction of labor. Mm -hmm. Right. But in both in mice and I also think in humans at the time of induction you don't see an increase in circulating oxytocin. But a colleague of mine at McGill identified uterine production oh. of oxytocin. Yeah. So cool. I was just wondering Absolutely. Right. So again, once again, um <clears throat> we kind of decided on oxytocin as our candidate based on three questions. What declines in blood with age? Has a receptors on muscle stem cells and activates MAP kinase signaling. That was our kind of screen, right? 
So we stumbled upon oxytocin. Um, and oxytocin has also positive effects on combating osteoporosis and a bunch of other tissue degeneration. Now, I do not necessarily know what controls the endocrine levels in young versus old mice, and we still have to do this work in humans. This is one of the quests, is actually to see if in plasma of old people, oxytocin also declines, and receptors are declining on their muscle stem cells. But one thing is that when we add ectopic oxytocin, we know that it is present in blood for like, you know, five minutes. It's very short-lived. But it does not mean that the effect is short lived because in five minutes it can activate tons of phosphoric. Phosphoric will activate 500 targets in every cell, and those targets will activate their targets. So, <laughs> and that's how you know, embryonic development works. So, you are totally right. And some, you know, some companies are asking me, would you like us to synthesize stronger agonists and which will last longer? And I'm saying we need to do research. We don't know if it will have positive or negative effects. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.